It's the Mike Missanelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. And welcome everybody to the Mike Missanelli Podcast. This is podcast number eight, Tuesday, October 11th, the Mike Missanelli Podcast. Brought to us by the great people at Bet Rivers. Don't forget to download that Bet Rivers app. But right now for the podcast, let's go in a different direction. By far the most important guest that uh, we've had so far uh, on the podcast, it is my pleasure to welcome legendary Hall of Fame Philadelphia and national journalist, the one, the only Ray Dinger. Hello, Ray. Good to see you. Michael, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Well, uh, let, let's talk about, first of all, uh, you're in retirement. And uh, I know a lot of people out there, when, when somebody steps away from the industry, first of all, it was a, it was a shock to a lot of people that you did it. Uh, but the second question is, OK, w- what do you do now? And the, the answer is never simple. So I'll, I'll ask you right away, what are you doing in retirement, the early days of retirement? How has that been for you? Um, it's been an adjustment. It really has been because, uh, you know, fr- frankly, uh, this I'm. <laughs> This doesn't speak well of me, I suppose. But, um, Mike, I never really had any hobbies. You know, I don't play golf. I don't play tennis. You know, I don't play any musical instruments. Uh, I don't do arts and crafts. Um, All I ever really did all my life was what I did for work. So when I stepped away, I kind of had to create um, a whole new kind of environment for myself. And I'm sort of finding out how that works. Uh, I was just telling you that I just my wife and I actually took uh, our first ever uh, autumn vacation. Uh, we spent two weeks in the UK. Uh, and so that was different. I had never, ever taken time off in September before in my life. So that was different. Um, so it's um, it's a different lifestyle. Uh, but, um, you know, there's still, you know, I'm still listening and watching and being part of the sports scene because right now in Philadelphia, there's a heck of a lot going on. There really are. And we'll talk about that uh, in, in a bit. But, uh, and I know that uh, you're, you're coming off of COVID. I'm coming off of COVID. Uh, it, it, you know, I, I avoided it for a really long time. I guess you did as well. But uh, you got it in the UK? We did. Uh, we did. We were, uh, we were in the UK. We, took a, we, we went to London. Uh, we spent some time in London. And then we got on a cruise ship to circumnavigate the uh, British Isles. So we worked our way up through Wales and Scotland and Ireland and Northern Ireland. We were having a fine old time. And then uh, one day my wife said, um, you know what? I just tested myself and I'm, I got COVID. Uh, and then um, she went into quarantine. They took her. She had to move out of the cabin and move into another cabin on the ship. Uh, and then a, a day later, of course, needless to say, I got it. And then I went into quarantine. So the last week of our trip through the U.K., we were, we were locked in our cabins. I mean, with leaving food outside our door. I mean, it was real leper colony stuff. So that's how we, wow. that's how we so hopefully the next vacation we take uh, will be a little better than that. But uh, we're back now. We tested negative and we're fine now. But that was, uh, we had a wonderful time while we were able to actually see the UK. I had never really seen it before. We loved it. We just sort of got cheated out of that last week. Yeah, well, it's a story you'll be able to tell forever, though. You got shackled in in the UK on your vacation with COVID. Uh, it, it's funny how this knocks you out. I'm still I'm still very weak from it. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it takes a while to get back your strength. But, but but let's talk. We were talking before we we actually started this recording here at that that you were one of the few journalists. I got to be, I, you know, you could count them on, one, on maybe three fingers where, where no one has a, a bad thing to say uh, about you. And, uh, you know, as a guy who has been through various stages of this journalism career, that unfortunately has never happened to me. I, I've, I've burned some bridges. I've, I've really ticked some people off. And I'm curious to know how you were able to do that all these years, because you you actually didn't shirk away from your journalistic responsibilities. You told it like it was. And, and you still came out un, pretty unscathed. Yeah, and I don't know how to explain that, Mike, uh, because I was certainly, um, I was not a panderer, uh, and I was not a, um, uh, you know, I was not a cheerleader. Uh, I mean, I considered myself a pretty objective reporter. Uh, I had no problems being critical. Uh, I mean, over time, I mean, I wrote some 
I wrote some pretty tough stuff. I mean, anybody that wants to, it goes back a ways now, but you go back and you look at some of the stuff I wrote about Len Toes back when he was the Eagles owner, when he tried to move the team to Arizona. Um, I mean, I wrote some stuff in there that I look back at now, and even I look back at it and say, well, that was pretty nasty. But I, I, the one thing I think that people always kind of understood about me, Mike, at least I hope so, is that I was honest. You know, I don't think people ever looked at me as somebody that had an agenda. I don't think they ever saw me as somebody that had a grudge. Uh, I think they saw me as somebody that that worked hard and was fair minded and was more than anything else, just honest. And in Philadelphia, honesty will get you a long way, Mike. I mean, you're you're proof of that. I think I'm proof of that to have any kind of shelf life in our business in this market. The first thing is people have to believe what you say and they have to believe you're honest in saying it. And, you know, I think for 50 years, I was I think that's how people saw me. And if and if that's how people remember me and if, you know, that's how that that that's my legacy, then I'm good with that. That, That's a great point. And so so let me go back to that, because, uh, you know, I, I grew up reading uh, all you guys and i i remember you, reading you at the bulletin i was a, a voracious reader of the newspaper as a kid because that's what we had and uh, i could not wait to get the afternoon bulletin and uh so so all the guys that shaped my journalistic career were you guys and and the stan hockmans of the world and the, and the dolsons and all those guys uh, and it was no holds barred this is how i grew up that okay you if you're honest, you're you're always trying to get the story. You're trying to get the truth. That was your responsibility to do it. Right. And, and if you offended people, that was a byproduct of it, and you just had to kind of suck it up. But as long as you were honest and fair, but there was no holds barred. You you went after people because you, you saw yourself as a, a consumer advocate, and that was your duty to the people who were your customer. Where did you see the you you will you agree the industry has changed and and where did it change and why? Oh boy, um, well you're sure right about that, Mike. Um, and that's kind of what brought me to that's kind of what brought me to retirement. Uh, that's what kind of brought me to the conclusion that you know in May when my contract ran out um, on radio and TV and I had to come down to the decision of do I extend or don't I extend. That's when I came to the hard realization that, you know, it's probably time to retire uh, because because things have changed so much. They really have changed so much. The games have changed. The business has changed. I mean, you've certainly seen it. You're part of it. Uh, and the honest truth of it is, Mike, over the last couple of years, I didn't enjoy it as much. You know, I mean, I for literally for 50 years, I loved what I did. Uh, I never felt like I really truly worked a day in my life because I loved it so much. Um, over the last few years, with the way the games have changed, um, you know, I would find myself sitting watching a Phillies game, uh, and I was bored. Uh, I'd be watching the Sixers because I knew I had to go on the radio the next morning and talk about it. And at halftime, I wasn't even sure I wanted to watch the second half. I never used to have those feelings before. The games have changed that much. Um, and it was beginning to feel like work to me. Uh, and I didn't like that feeling. And so I had to decide, do I want to continue on doing it? Because I could. I mean, I could continue. I could have continued doing it. But it just didn't feel the same. And, you know, at 75 years old, after 53 years of doing it, um, I just got the feeling, you know, it's probably time. You know, it's uh, I, I am fully aware. And every time I walked in the press box, I became more aware of the fact of 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 how much older I was than everybody around me. I mean, the, the other people around me, I mean, they were young enough, not just to be my children, but my grandchildren. And I just said, you know, enough, enough. I, I really began to, for the first time, I really began to feel like an old guy in a young man's business. And I just decided it was time. And, you know, I made the decision in May. I felt it was the right decision. It wasn't easy because I still really felt grateful for that, to be doing what I was doing. Uh, it was all I ever wanted to do my whole life. But I just felt that it was time, and I'm pretty comfortable with that. Um, we're talking to Ray Ginger. Uh, Ray, h- how and why did it change? And, you know, I, everybody has theories because, obviously, you there's so many more outlets anymore, and, and young people can get into the business just by logging on. Um, but it seems to me that the teams right now, the change, uh, what's reflective of the change is that the teams can now define their own coverage. There are so many people out there that need information right. that if you don't play ball, 
you're not going to get the information, which gives them kind of an immunity. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, I think that's a very fair characterization. Yes. Um, you know, a lot of a lot I did a lot of people interviewed me, you know, over the last few months when I retired and they always asked how do things what's changed? What did you see change over time? Well, wow, where do you start? I mean, it's I mean, it's so different now. But the biggest thing was just the access, uh, the access to information, the ability to be a real reporter. Um, I mean, I remember when I first going back to the days that you were talking about when I was writing for the Bulletin uh, back in the early 70s, when I was just a 23 year old kid covering the Eagles. uh, uh, There was no sports talk radio. There was no cable television. There was no regional sports TV. There was nothing. It was a newspaper world and we owned it. Uh, And. So we had all of that access. I mean, after an Eagles game in the 1970, 71, 72, back in those days, when the game ended, be five or six guys would walk in to talk to the coach. The post-game press conference was that. It was four or five guys standing around a desk and the coach sitting behind the desk answering questions. And then you walked in the locker room, and if you had a good relationship with the players, which I pretty much did, um, you could go up to these guys and talk to them about anything you wanted. And if you wanted to, if you could ask them something and they could say to you, all right, look, I'll tell you what happened on that play, but don't quote me on it, but you want to know what happened. Here's what happened. And they'll lay it out for you. Well, you know, the idea of coaches, coaches can't go off the record. You know, Nick Sirianni can't go off the record after a game. He can't say, Hey fellas, this is off the record. But when he's on live TV and there's, and there's a hundred writers in the room. There's, that ain't off the record. That's as on the record as it can be. But that's today's world of trying to cover a football team versus what it was in the 70s. And the farther away I got from the message and what you were just talking about it is the team's abilities and the league's ability now to control the message by making certain people available, bringing them up to a podium, controlling the environment, you know, it's deciding when the press conference was over, this, all of that stuff, you know, they now control the message. And um, it's much, much harder, much, much harder for a reporter to do his job and serve the public, which is ultimately what we were all trying to do anyway. One of the strangest things on that note that I've seen, uh, you, you were a journalist back in the day where you had to get the story and you were competitive in breaking the story against your competitors. And um, today, the, the local guys rely on the national guys to break the stories on their own beat, w- which I, I find <laughs> very unusual, but I guess commonplace. W- what, can you speak to that at all? Um, you're right. You're right. Um, I mean, how many stories do you see uh, in our local media where they'll, they'll break news and they'll say, per whoever reported it nationally. Well, okay, give them credit for giving credit. <laughs> you know, they're not just stealing it. Uh, if somebody else breaks the story, they'll give that guy credit. But I'm thinking if, if you're on the beat, you're the reporter, why didn't you break that story? Um, you know, there's so much of this stuff that's going on now, Mike. There's so much of it. Um, listen, Mike, when I first got into it in 1970, there weren't even agents, okay? That Eagles team that I covered in 1970, I think there was there was one guy. I'm really I think one guy on the team had an agent, and that was Leroy Keys, the first round draft pick. He had an agent named Arthur Morse, and it was like everybody said, "What? Who? An agent? What? What does an agent do?" Um, but now, I mean, everybody has agents, uh, and the agents all love to talk to the press, and you know, and they have a pecking order of who they talk to. So they'll talk to the Adam Schefters, and they'll talk to the uh, Ian Rappaports and stuff the national guys, and that's how the information tends to get out. And sometimes the local guy winds up being last in the, uh, you know, last in the batting order and those sorts of things. But it's, it's hard to get to the players now. It's hard to get to the coaches now. And when that's true, then it's hard to get to the information. Yeah, it's just sanitized to the point where the agent or the team knows that they'd rather favor the national perception. That's more important than than the local perception. If if we can look good nationally, we feed feed these national guys tidbits. We have a friend forever, right? And, and, and so and, that's right. what they cultivate. Exactly. And as you said just a couple moments ago, um, the there was none of that. That didn't exist. You know, NFL.com, 
didn't exist it back in the day. ESPN didn't exist. Foxes, you know, it's, that national that national media umbrella really didn't exist. So it wasn't a market that anyone felt like they needed to serve. If the teams were going to serve anybody, they were going to serve the local beat guys because they were the guys whose voices really mattered. Those were the guys where people, those are the guys people came to for the news. So if they were going to leak anything to anybody, they were going to leak it to the local media because the local media was was king. And that's not true anymore. No, it's not. We're talking to Ray Dinger, uh, legendary uh, Philadelphia journalist now in retirement. Ray, you know, I, I could talk to you for, for forever and, and, and uh, tap into your, your, your source. And can you give me like if somebody asked you, OK, what, what were the uh, a couple of the top stories that always resonate with you that you were involved in uh, covered? What, what pops up? Um, I think the one that will always stand head and shoulders above them all is Super Bowl 52. Uh, was that whole run, that whole season, uh, and then that team, in, in the unlikely fashion that they did it, finally doing the one thing that everybody wanted most of all, which was bring the Lombardi Trophy home to Philadelphia. Um, that was it. Um, and, you know, Angelo, Angelo Cataldi, I was on with him after I announced my retirement. I was on with him that following week, and he asked me a really interesting question that I honestly had never really thought about. And Angelo said, if the Eagles hadn't won that Super Bowl, would you be retiring? Uh, and I, I honestly hadn't really thought about that, you know. Uh, and, and when I did, I, you know, I, I said, I don't know. You know, I honestly can't, I, I can't answer that. I know that them having won it and me being here to cover it when they won it made it easier to retire. Uh, but I don't know. Would I have hung on for a couple more years in the hope that maybe they could have won it? And who knows, maybe this will be that year. Uh, I don't know. Um, but that was that was that was the biggest, Mike. That was the biggest. But prior to that, I got to go all the way back to the Broad Street Bullies. That was uh, I was a young reporter then. Uh, I was just a kid myself, just a couple years out of college. Uh, but covering that team and I was like the fourth sidebar guy. I mean, I wasn't the beat guy. I wasn't the columnist. I was the fourth sidebar guy. But just being around that whole run to the first cup, especially was was just so much fun. And to see that, I mean, that parade was really the first of the parades. I mean, now we just take it for granted. Oh, they won, there'll be a parade. Um, there, there were no parades. I mean, the, the idea of having a parade for the Flyers was new, uh, like everything else about that team. Uh, and to be caught up in that whole feeling of euphoria uh, and to see what that team's win did to the whole city of Philadelphia. If you're, you know, for people... For younger people, and we're going back now 50 years, but I mean, the, all the Philadelphia teams were really bad in the early 70s. I mean, the Phillies were really bad. The Eagles were the worst team in football. The Sixers were coming off the 9-73 and 73 when they weren't even trying to tank. I mean, all the teams, it was about as bad a time in Philadelphia in sports as you could imagine. And then all of a sudden, boom, here comes this hockey team out of nowhere, and they won the Stanley Cup. And it just totally, it, it was sort of like it just lifted a cloud off the city of Philadelphia. And then within just a matter of a couple of years, you know, Dick Vermeil comes to the Eagles, let Julius Irving signs with the Sixers, um, Pete Rose signs with the Phillies. And by the end of the decade, they were all winning. But it started with the Flyers in 73, 74, 75. And to have a front row seat to that, man, that was that was a lot of fun. It really was a good era, and, and, and you're right. They did kickstart winning in the city, and I actually think they made a deal with the devil because they haven't won since. <laughs> but uh, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in a second. Who were the most memorable guys that you ever covered? In terms of watching them play or in terms of personality? Or maybe either. Either an interesting personality or, or watching them play. Um, for, me, for me, it's always Reggie White. Right. You know, when I look at it, I was just captivated by the guy. Um, Reggie's right there. Reggie's right there for me. When I when I wrote my book, uh, when I wrote my memoir uh, a year ago, Finished Business, sort of looking back over the 50 years, I kind of felt somewhere in that book I had to devote a chapter to picking who I thought was the greatest athlete I covered in my 50 years in Philadelphia. I felt like I kind of to write the book and not make that and not say that and come to that conclusion, I would have felt like I was sort of copping out. So um, I did that. I looked back over the 50 years and I thought about it and I came down to four guys. Um, I, I came down to Reggie White, Bobby Clark, Julius Irving, 
and Mike Schmidt. Those are my four. Uh, and then I kind of had a way, okay, which of the four, if I had to pick one, who was it going to be? And I picked Schmidt. Um, because I'll tell you, Mike, when I went back, look, I covered his whole 18 years. I mean, I covered all of it. Uh, and I knew he was great. Heck, we all knew he was great. Um, but when I went back and began looking up his stats to, when I was writing that chapter, I just thought, my God, he was even better than I thought he was. You know, you look back and you look back at his career. It's, it's a funny thing. If you see greatness on a daily basis, you can almost begin to take greatness for granted, as crazy as that sounds. And I think that's kind of the way it was with Schmidt. When I went back and looked at it, Mike, I mean, we all know 548 home runs. We all know three MVPs. But to me, this and 10, 10 gold gloves, I mean, that's pretty heavy stuff. But the stat that just blew me away, and I had forgotten this, Mike, do you know he led the National League in home runs eight times? Can you think about that? A guy led the National League in home runs eight times? I mean, only one player in the history of baseball led his league in home runs more seasons, and that was Babe Ruth. Uh, 12 times in the American League. And and that was back in that day. In the modern era, nobody's close to Schmidt in terms of that kind of production. So, I mean, as much as I loved Reggie, Reggie's the best defensive lineman I ever saw. I will truly say that. And Clark, in terms of night in and night out, I never saw anybody play harder than he did every single game. And Doc was Doc. You know, I mean, Doc was Doc. Um, but if I had to pick one, it was Schmidt. Um, and what's really interesting... <laughs> What was really interesting was when I retired, when I announced my retirement, um, I came home and went to my email. And I mean, there were lots of emails. I mean, like 120 emails the first day. And I'm looking through them. And all of a sudden, I come up, there's one, Mike Schmidt. And I said, wait a minute, this can't be the same Mike Schmidt. And it was. It was. And I hadn't talked to Mike in 20 years. Uh, but he heard me say that I was retiring. Uh, and he sent me just this beautiful email uh, about how, look, I know that I didn't always have the greatest relationship with the media during my career uh, and all of that stuff. He said, but I always thought that you really did a good job. Uh, and I always thought you were fair. He said, even when you were critical, I thought you were fair. Uh, and I just uh, I never really said that, but I just wanted you to know I appreciated the way you went about your business. Um, that, that's interesting that, that you bring him up as well, because he could also be personality wise. Uh, he, he was um, he was compelling in, in that he was different. And uh, so there was always that storyline about Mike Schmidt beyond his greatness. He was kind of this this tortured guy. As he was going through it. Exactly right. That's a very good description. Um, one of the things I wrote about Schmidt in that chapter was um, if you go back through the archive of pictures of Mike Schmidt in his career, and again, he played 18 years. I mean, the guy was photographed a million times. If you go to like to the Inquirer archives or the Bulletin archives and you pull out that folder with all of his photography, all of the pictures over the years, try to find one where he's smiling. They just don't exist. I mean, for a guy who was as great as he was, um, the angst that he carried with him was just amazing. And, and I remember him telling me one time, he didn't share a whole lot of his deep thoughts. I mean, he was not Stuart smiling by any means. Deep thoughts were not the kind of thing that Mike trafficked in. But I remember one time him talking about his father uh, and how hard his father was on him uh, and saying that he went to uh, like a little league game. I don't know if he was eight, nine, ten, whatever. Uh, and he went three for four uh, and knocked in a winning run, blah, blah, blah. But the whole drive home, all his father talked about was the one time he made he was out. Uh, and I always thought that that seemed to me to be that he had never quite gotten that out of his system. I mean, as great a player as he was, uh, he, he just worried about the next day and the next at bat. Uh, and he never really allowed himself to enjoy his own greatness. Uh, and that made him a tough guy to cover. You know, because every, you know, he'd get the game winning hit. And you'd want to go to him and have him talk about getting the game winning home run. And and he was already thinking about, oh, no, tomorrow I got Candelaria, you know, and I never hit him. He was always he always seemed to be feeling that burden. And that was why one of the great things that Pete Rose brought to the team when Pete Rose signed with the Phillies was he was in the locker room with Schmidt every night. And what he was doing more than anything else was reminding Schmidt of how great he was. He was Pete Rose's greatest quality to the Phillies 
was he kept reminding Mike Schmidt that he was Mike Schmidt and uh, and made him. And I, there's no accident that 1980 was Schmidt's greatest year. MVP of the regular season, MVP of the, of the World Series, because Pete Rose was there the whole time just telling him, man, you're the greatest. Just go up there and play. I mean, it was that he wanted he wanted Mike to adopt the same attitude that he had was just go out. You're a great player. Just go play. And I think it finally took a while. And, you know, we finally began to see that that true greatness come out. Uh, let me let me segue into y- y- the transitions you've had in your career. Uh, it's funny when you start out in in journalism. You know, first of all, I, you knew what you wanted to do right away at a very young age. I mean, you're 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 fi- you're Philly, you're Delco Temple, and and you followed these teams, and you you knew right away that you wanted to be this sports journalist. Uh, journalist probably age twelve. I I, I didn't know that, as, but uh, you you conquered that that early on. So when you grow up and doing newspapers, there's nothing more exciting than being a newspaper guy. I mean, I, I look back at it now. My best years were, were working for the Inquirer and covering stuff on Deadline and, and all that stuff. And there were two transitions that got my attention. Uh, one of them was yours leaving the Daily News to go to NFL Films. And the other was Angela, who I was working with on the Inquirer staff at the time, deciding that Sports Talk Radio was going to be his full-time gig and he was going to leave newspapers. And we were all aghast at, at that both of you guys making that kind of transition. Take me back to that transition and how difficult it was for you to do that. Um, it, was, it was difficult because I was 50 years old. Um, and it was, I, was, I was going over to try and do something I had never done before, which was become a filmmaker. You know, and, uh, you know, I had been in newspapers my whole life. I've been in newspapers almost 30 years. I knew I could do that. Um, but I didn't know that I could be a TV producer. I didn't know that I could be a film editor. I didn't know that I could write for the screen. Um, and there was a real fear because when I left the paper, uh, I, I originally, Mike, when I, when NFL films came to me and offered me a gig, what I tried to do originally was work out a leave of absence with the daily news. That was the, that was what I tried. That was the deal I tried to strike was with the sports editor say, listen, they've got me working on this project. It's going to take me one year. It's going to take me one year. The, the, the show is going to air next September. Uh, at that point, you know, I'll come back to the Daily News. I want to see this thing through because I really love this project. But, you know, I w- I'll come back to the paper next year. Uh, but give me one year leave of absence to do this. That that was what I originally was thinking about. Um, and they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't give me the year's leave of absence. They said, no, if you want to go do this, you got to go. Um, and so I had to th- at that point, I thought, oh, my God, I mean, if this doesn't work out and you know, I finish this film and, um, you know, now I got to go look for another job and I'm 50 years old. Um, so it was really kind of scary. And I had to talk it over with my wife and she said, well, what do you want to do? Um, and I said, I, I want to make this movie. And she said, then go do it. Uh, and I said, well, you know, what about after? She said, we'll worry about that then. And so she gave me the assurance to do it. And I went and did it. And six months into the project, Steve Sable, God bless him, uh, took, pulled, called me in one day and said, you know, this we really like having you here. How, how about if you just stay on? You know, we'll finish up this film, but we want you to stay on and become a full time producer. So I did. Um, and, you know, and I, I remember saying to him, Steve, Steve, I don't know how to cut film. I don't know how to edit music. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes into this that I don't really know how to do. And Steve said, look, he said, you know, football and you know how to tell a story. The rest of it we can teach you. Uh, and so, you know, I knew I, I knew Steve for years. We were good friends. I certainly knew NFL films wasn't going anywhere. They weren't going out of business. So I just put my trust in them. I said, OK. You know, I'll, I'll give this a try. And uh, I went there and I was there for 12 years and it was great. I mean, it was uh, I mean, it was probably the one chapter in my life that I never foresaw. I mean, I didn't see it coming. And frankly, I had never prepared for it, but it was a great, great experience. I wouldn't trade those 12 years for anything. Uh, then moving on to Sports Talk Radio, and I, I know you were uh, involved in that for a while as well. Um, the, the evolution of sports talk radio in this town is very interesting to me because it, it began on, on the heels of, of all, all of us journalists. Uh, and, and, you know, that, because there was a, it was a guy who named Tom Bigby who said, you know, these guys really know what they're talking about. Plus they have personalities that deliver it. And that seems to be the formula for sports talk radio. So it was all spawned from newspapers. 
And uh, when you when you look at it now, it, it's completely different. When you look at the state of sports talk radio now, what do you see? Um, I see um, I see it changing. You know, we've we've talked a lot about how the business is changing, and I see it changing now. Um, it's becoming um, it, it's becoming too hot takeish for my taste. Uh, I really kind of thought what we started doing, when I say we, I mean you and Angelo and me and Al and all the people that sort of were the first wave of newspaper guys that crossed over, was you know, our idea was to try to bring the new, newspaper level reporting and information to the radio. You know, instead of just putting it in the newspaper, instead of putting it, typing it into a computer, we were speaking it into a microphone. But it's basically the same thing. It was all reporting uh, and it was all based on our experience and real reporting and real true information, as opposed to just what, not all of it, but a lot of it today is all just said for effect. Uh, It's all just a lot of stuff said that stir controversy, uh, a lot of, you know, phony debates back and forth, guys taking positions that they don't really believe, but it just makes for a good 30 minute conversation. Uh, I could never engage in that. I mean, I, I was never... I just wasn't comfortable doing that. You mentioned Tom Bigby. Uh, I remember when Tom was running things at WIP, you know, he called me in one time and he said, you know, I've been listening to you on the radio. And he said, you know, you got good information. You're a smart guy. You know what you're talking about. He said, but I'd like to get a little more pizzazz in there. I'd like to get a little more, you know, a little more oomph, a little bit more edge to what you're saying. And I said, look, I stopped. I said, Tom, look, I said, let's, I can do what I I'm, I can do what I do. Okay, I can do this kind of stuff. I can do this kind of radio. I can talk to people. I can answer questions. I can try and be informative, and I can try and be an honest reporter, which is all I've ever tried to be. But don't ask me to be something I'm not, because I can't do that. So what we have to decide right now is: um, Do you want me to continue doing what I'm doing? Because I can do that. But if you're going to tell me that you want me to all of a sudden become something else, then let's just shake hands and, sit and call it a day because I can't, I can't do that. And he said, no, 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 keep going ahead and doing, doing what you're doing. He said, I just thought that I, I said, no, I can't do that. Um, and I think more and more of the business following sort of the model of what we're seeing, you know, on the, on, on sports TV and on the cable TV and on the ESPNs and, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those shows on those, on there, which to me is just, uh, I, I don't, put much stock in anything that's said, because I don't know if anybody believes what they're saying. Uh, uh, but, and I know some of that has crept into radio because it's a good way to draw attention to yourself. You know, you, people say, you know, boy, did you hear what they said on the radio today? Did you hear what so-and-so said? Well, if that's what you're going for, fine. I mean, that's fine. But to me, I could never do that. I, I feel like I'm still, Mike, I still feel like I'm still pretty grounded in the same basic journalistic principles that I had when I got into it in writing back in 1970. I'm just doing it in a different medium. All I can do is try and get good information, analyze it as honestly as I can, and present it in an honest and fair-minded fashion. That's all I can do. Yeah, I, I think that we all had to learn to be entertainers when we made that transition. But we, the difference between us and now is that we had a base you know, we had life experience. We had uh, the the ability to interview. And so we took all that stuff with us, and then we had to add the entertainment part, which we it was hard for all of us to understand. But uh, we eventually uh, all got it. Uh, and just a couple of fun things before we wrap up here. Uh, I, want to talk, I want you to talk about the softball thing, because uh, you know I, I was obviously a college baseball player, and. Right. Uh, so when I got out and I realized I wasn't good enough to get to the next level, I started playing in these high-level softball leagues. And I, I had moved into the Norristown area. There were two hotbeds of softball. One was Norristown, one was Bristol, where I grew up. But Norristown, I joined this team, and it was called Class A Softball. And we would travel down the East Coast for, in, and for money tournaments. And, and, and Class A Softball is like stacking nine home run hitters and then throwing me in the 10th spot for defense and maybe get some singles, but it was lucrative. We would travel down to the, the, the Richmond, Virginia, and down the coast. And at that time, you were playing, actually, a professional softball team pops up in this area. Right. And, and tell me the story of you and the Philadelphia Athletics. Um, I actually played with a couple of your guys. Um, a couple of the guys on our original team in 1978 were from Norristown, a guy named Charlie Donolfi uh, and, yep. and a guy named Dale Hood. Uh, 
uh, were both guys that came out of Norristown and were really, really good players. I mean, we're part of our initial team. Um, yeah, I mean, Mike, it was just on a whim. Uh, I mean, I played a lot of baseball. I played a lot of softball. I enjoyed it. I really did. Uh, and then they created this team called, the, I heard they were creating this team called the Philadelphia Athletics that was going to play professionally. They were going to play at Veterans Stadium. Uh, and I said, you know what? I'm going to try out. I'm just, I, it was like a, one of these big open tryouts, like a Vince Papali kind of tryout. Uh, and uh, I went down there and I tried out. And uh, they didn't know who I was. They just pinned a number on my back, hit me some ground balls, we took some BP. I survived the first round. I survived the second round. I survived the third round. Uh, next thing you know, I'm on the team. Uh, and it was it was really a lot of fun. I mean, I'm, all of a sudden, I'm playing on a team with Johnny Callison, <laughs> who was one of my boyhood heroes, uh, and Billy White Shoes Johnson, who was then uh, like Rookie of the Year with the Houston Oilers, uh, and who, as you no surprise, could cover a lot of ground in center field. Uh, probably hit a ground ball to the third baseman and got a triple out of it. Mike, Most likely, right? <laughs> uh, I, I will tell you this, and this is, you're going to think I'm kidding, but I'm not. He once tugged up on first base and scored on a fly ball. He tugged <laughs> up at first and scored. That's, that's, I, I never saw anybody move faster on a baseball field than Billy White Shoes Johnson. Uh, and in fact, this, uh, this very weekend, they're unveiling a statue of Billy Johnson uh, in Marcus Hook, back where he grew up. And I will be there for that ceremony. Uh, but yeah, I played two years. I played 78. And seventy nine um, with the with the Philadelphia Athletics and just had a ball. I mean, it was really really a fun league. Uh, so I, from what I recall, because I remember our guys talking about this, whether they wanted to take a shot and, and move over to that, and I I understand that you guys were making a thousand dollars for the season. Am I right? Was it a thousand bucks? So well, Callison was making more than that. So those that's got we we were making like five hundred bucks to play in a tournament. And those guys go, we would take a peg cut if we had to play with this team. It was weird how, cla- how cla- class A softball, well, it was very lucrative if you played in those tournaments. So th- that prevented those guys from going over there. I would say we had about five guys on our team that made that actually made some money. Johnny, obviously, was the player manager. Okay. Um, Billy White Shoes, you right. had to pay him because, I mean, he, Okay. You, you weren't going to get him for free. And then we had, and then we had three guys who were real, I mean, real pros. Um, a guy named Larry Hutcherson, who was from Virginia, who came in. Uh, he had played professionally before. I mean, and he was our best power hitter. They were paying him real money. And we also got a guy named, his real name, his real name real, truly was Johnny Dollar. Uh, and he was also from Virginia. And we brought him in and they, and he was a real pro. And they were paying him real money. The rest of the guys were playing for maybe uh, 500 bucks. I didn't take anything because, you know, I was still working for the newspaper, so I couldn't. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, you were working for the newspaper. How did you pull that off as far as travel goes and all that stuff? Because you still had everyday job responsibilities. I did. I did. And um, the, the paper was pretty good, but they weren't happy about it. I'll tell, I can tell <laughs> you that they weren't happy about it, but they kind of worked with me. Uh, the games were always played on the weekends. It was Saturday, Sundays. Um, so I would always write ahead for the Sunday paper. I would write on Friday. So I was writing for the Sunday paper and they just used to give me Sundays off. Uh, and, and that was it. And, um, I, you know, I, I signed a contract, which I still have in my drawer here. Uh, but I never took the money because I couldn't very well take the money from, from a team in town. So I was the one guy who played for free, but I, uh, I would do it again in a heartbeat. It was really a lot of fun. Oh, they they were stringent about you taking stuff back in the day with newspapers. <laughs> no, I think all that's out the window now. All right, last, last story. You got to tell the folks the Christy Brinkley story, uh, which is mind boggling to me. But so I, I okay, Christy Brinkley, Ray Dinger. What's the story? Um, it Mike, it is true. <laughs> A lot of people say, "No, you're kidding," but no, it is true. Um, it was uh, Roberto Duran, Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, the second, it was the rematch down in New Orleans. Uh, I was I was columnist for the Daily News, uh, and they sent me down there to cover it. And so I'm down in New Orleans, and um, like two days, two, three days before the fight, I go to the Duran workout. And um, there's you know a dozen or so writers there watching Duran hit the bags and skip rope. And lo and behold, who else is there but Christy Brinkley? Uh, with a camera, and she's walking around snapping all kinds of photographs. And um, it turns out that Don King, who was the promoter, 
brought Christy Brinkley down to just be part of the scenery, just to add a little glamour to the event. Not that it needed a whole lot. I mean, Leonard Duran was pretty glamorous in itself, but okay, you want to bring Christy Brinkley down, I'm fine with that. So she's walking around and um, and so she just comes drifting over to where the sports, where the writers are. And she strikes up a conversation with me of all people. Uh, and she just starts talking about, I've ne- I don't know anything about boxing. I've never been around this before. Um, tell me something about, tell me a little bit about Roberto Duran's background. And so, you know, I go into the whole bit that he, he's Panama, poor kid, grew up on the streets, rich guy found him, took him to a gym, learned how to fight, blah, blah, blah. You know, I give her the Cliff's Notes version of the Roberto Duran story. And, you know, I'm kind of enjoying it. And she seems very pleasant. And so the, the workout ends. Uh, and uh, she says to me, um, yeah, that was really interesting. And if I'm going to be here and be part of this, I'd really like to learn more about what's going on. Why don't you and I go to lunch? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, Mike. And, Mike, <laughs> this is Christy Brinkley, 1981. I mean, she, she was the most gorgeous thing. Oh, oh yeah, I she had was. Ever she was seen. always my favorite. I, oh, I swear to God. But anyway, um, I am I am on deadline, Mike. I mean, I've been told they want me to do like this 50 inch Roberto Duran takeout, uh, and I have to have it in the office back in Philadelphia, like in three hours. And you know me well enough from back in the day. I was like the slowest writer in the world, so I was going to be hard pressed to get that story turned around in that amount of time anyway. And so I, I knew I I had no choice. I had to go back to my room and write the story. So I had to look Christy Brinkley right in the eye and say, that's, that's a lovely offer, but no, I can't do it. I have to go upstairs and write. Well, that's, that's Um, that's dedication to the crap, but here's the thing. Don't sell yourself short because Christy could have picked any uh, journalist. She picks you because you're a, a handsome debonair guy at the time, right? And not only that, but then you go forward with the conversation. Most guys, would, Christy Brinkley would come up and go, can you tell me a little bit? And they go, oh, 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 oh. but you actually had the conversation with her. That would just, mm-hmm. you know, that shows a lot of poise. <laughs> I, I don't know what I, I don't know what I, why I would have done. That would have been maybe my shortest story ever, but I wouldn't pass up lunch with her. <laughs> well, as as the story has been told and retold and retold, it's now taken on, you know, this whole idea that she was actually sort of coming on to me, <laughs> which I can assure you, I can assure you. Was but not see, the that's story. not the story you tell. You absolutely tell people that she was coming on to you. How's it, <laughs> no. how's it going to hurt? How would that hurt your legacy? Now, listen, if she had been truly interested, OK, it would have been very easy to say, oh, OK, you're writing now. Well, why don't we do dinner tonight? Or why don't we go out tomorrow? There was no, there was none of that. So you, wait, wait. Mike, so you didn't make no a counter proposal. There was no subtext. You did not make the counter proposal. Uh, listen, I'm dedicated to my craft, which I'm sure you can appreciate being dedicated to your craft. So how about tomorrow? <laughs> no, Mike, that to me was a bridge too far. I saw this for exactly what it was. I mean, it was just, you know, a lunch, a con- little conversation about Roberto Duran. Uh, and that was it, which in and of itself, if I hadn't had that story to write, I would have done it in a second. OK, but the fact of the matter was I knew they needed that. They, knew, they needed that story and they needed it right now. So, you know, I had to take one for the team. What can I tell I you? I got news for you. Not only am I telling the story, but I'm not embellishing it. And I'm going, you know, what Christy's doing right now. She's she's got a bottle of wild turkey and she's slugging it. And she's going, boy, I really messed that thing up with Ray Dinger. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure it's a regret she carries to this day. <laughs> Instead, I got hooked up with that creep Billy Joel and everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ray, well, I got you. I got to talk about this Eagle team, which is now undefeated, the only undefeated team in the league. And uh, uh, I think the schedule has helped a little bit, but they look legitimate to me. And who knows, uh, the teams they play, there's just a couple teams that you go, okay, they could lose this. But for the most part, they look like a team that's going to be very successful win-loss-wise and maybe get a number one seed and win a division. We'll see what, if that happens. What do you think of them? Um, I think that's – yeah, I think you and I see it kind of the same way, Mike. I, you know, I heard somebody ask me the other day, is, is this a great team? I said, no, no, they're not a great team. Um, but they're good. They are, they are good. That's not, a, it, that's not an illusion. I mean, they're, they're good. Um, but the, right now, this is a year where the NFL – 
it's a very level field. I mean, I think the Bills and the Chiefs are the two best teams, um, but the Eagles are right in that next group. I think right now they are the best team in the NFC. Uh, and, you know, some years, I mean, every year it takes on a different personality. And some years in the NFL, there are a couple of teams that are just head and shoulders above everybody else. And, you know, yeah, we're good, but we can't play with those guys. Well, I mean, this is one of those years where I think everybody can kind of make a case for themselves. Maybe this is our year. You know, maybe we're the right team in the right place at the right time. Uh, and I think that's kind of the way the Eagles are right now. I mean, they're, um, they did a really good job the offseason. Um, they're certainly – they're deeper and they're faster. You can see that. Uh, and defensively, they can now begin to do the things that they weren't able to do last year, which is pressure the quarterback – and force turnovers, force takeaways. And even on a day when they didn't play great, like they did in Arizona, the thing is they, they didn't turn the ball over, they controlled the ball for 35 minutes, and they only committed three penalties, which were incidental. They didn't beat themselves, you know? They didn't do the dumb things that lose games. Uh, and the way the league is set up right now, if that's what you are, you can go a long way. There, there are two things that we looked at coming into this year, and, um, um, I think one of them may may have solved it, and that's the the quarterback, the Jalen Hurts situation, and the other was was uh, Jonathan Gannon and whether he would be aggressive enough. Now uh, you know better than anybody, and I work with him now, Seth Joyner, who I'm pretty sure uh, when he was a toddler, first uh, word that came out of his mouth was blitz, is always on Gannon for not being aggressive enough. So let's take that first. Has he evolved as a defensive coordinator? Are they playing it the right way? And then second, we'll go to Hertz. And what, what have you seen that's made him improve the most? Yeah, I, uh, I do think he is. Um, I mean, you can see the difference. I mean, last year they only had 29 sacks all year. It's the fewest sacks the team had had in 49 years. Um, and as a result, if you don't get sacks, you don't get takeaways, uh, you tend to not be very good in the red zone. It's, um, that's why when people were saying they were a top 10 defense last year, to me, those numbers are very misleading because they didn't make the plays that you need to make to win games. They didn't make big plays. Um, and some of it, I couldn't tell how much of it was philosophical, how much of it was because that's the way Gannon calls the game, or if it was just the limitations he had in terms of his personnel. Uh, so this year when they went out and they got Redick uh, and they got um, uh, Bradbury uh, and they drafted uh, Davis and they brought in they clearly, and, and they brought in White, the linebacker, they, they clearly had better personnel, faster, more playmaking personnel. That's when I kind of said, okay, let me just sit back now and see if Gannon can coach. You know, let's, you know, because now he's got some – last year he didn't really have those kinds of players. Now he does. Let's see. And what you're seeing now is he is willing to be more aggressive. He is willing to take more chances because he really does trust that he has another corner opposite Slay who can cover one-on-one and not get killed down the field. So um, I think Gannon is hes showing me a, a, a more aggressive, um, inventive sort of style of coaching, which I think was necessary. As far as Hertz goes, um, you know, Mike, I was, I, I, I was not as surprised as a lot of people are that Hertz has played well. Um, I mean, you just look at – if you compare him today to the guy that he was – at the first time we saw him in Alabama, um, I mean, back then he couldn't throw the ball from here to that window. I mean, he, he, I mean, he just he was a running back playing quarterback is what he was. Uh, but boy, th- th- this is a guy who just works his butt off to improve. Uh, and you can see that. I mean, when he went from Alabama to Oklahoma, he was he was a much better player. Uh, and then when he came to the NFL, you saw him improve yet again. And then last year when he became the starter, he improved yet again. And I kind of see him as a guy who's on that track, <clears throat> that he's just going to keep working at what he needs to work on and improving what he needs to improve. And you're going to see that kind of growth. Uh, Ray, listen, this has been a pleasure, man. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's so funny because working for a competitor station, I couldn't even mention your name. And so here we are <laughs> sitting down having a great conversation. And I really appreciate it. My, my best to you in retirement. Uh, I, I know you'll, uh, you'll enjoy it, and uh, it's time for you to kick back and relax, just like I guess it's time for all of us eventually. <laughs> Thanks for being with me, Ray. I appreciate it. Mike, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Take care, man. Well, that's going to do it for podcast number eight. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our conversation with Ray Dinger. We'll be back at you later in a week with some Philly talk, hopefully to Phillies.
are in the lead in this NLDS. This is Mike Missinelli. Thanks, everybody. It's the Mike Missinelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. We'll talk to you later. Thanks for listening to the Mike Missinelli Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.